Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Z Learning. We are live here this morning behind the scenes. Thank you all for joining us this morning. My name is Milo, and today we are actually inside of our aquarium and reptile complex. Now, I'm going to guess most of you haven't been back here. It's nice and toasty and warm back here, but we are in our propagation room. And don't worry, that's a big, huge word. I promise you we'll explain it here in a little bit. But I'm going to be joined by one of our animal care professionals. Her name is Karen, and she is a herpetologist here, which means she takes care of our amphibians and reptiles. And we're going to meet here in just a second. But I want to say good morning to Michelle, Ashley, Ella. Nice to see all of you. Thanks for tuning in live. You are all in for a very special encounter. We're gonna get very nice and up and close and personal with some of our youngest residents right here in the aquarium and reptile complex. Jackson, nice to see you this morning. And Emma, thanks for tuning in. Nice to see y'all this morning. But I'm gonna go ahead, without further ado, let me go and turn around this camera. Like I said, we are behind the scenes, so we have our face masks on, of course, while we practice some social distancing. But we're gonna get ice and up and close and personal to those animals. Let's turn around this camera and say good morning to Karen. This is Karen, she's one of our herpetologist staff. Now, Karen, if you can't tell, take a closer look at what she has in her hand. She has one of our smallest additions right here to our reptile collection. Karen, can you go ahead and tell us who or what species we are looking at? Yeah, these are uh, baby green tree pythons. So those of you who saw it yesterday on social media, we kind of did that teaser post of a picture of an adult green tree python. They look a little different, don't they? So tell us a little bit more because they're called green tree pythons. Why are they yellow in color now then? <laughs> right, so their babies actually um, can range in two different colors. They're either this nice yellow color or sometimes even a brick red color when they're juveniles and that's gonna help them camouflage. Um, in the wild, they're gonna stay more close to the forest edge um, versus as an adult and that color change happens, uh, they'll move up into the tree canopy. That is awesome. What a fascinating thing. I have to give a shout out quick though. We just had a group tune in from North Augusta. Thanks for tuning in. It's nice to see all of you educators joining us. Take a look at that individual. We're going to try to get a close look. Hopefully we can get a, a quick peek here at these tiny little individuals. Now, Karen, how many do we actually have here? We have more than just the individual you're holding right now. Correct. Uh, we actually hatched 14 babies. Whoa. Um, we have a clutch of 18 eggs. Okay, so we're kind of peeking at not all 14 though, right? Not all 14. Okay, I was gonna say, I'm counting them quick and I didn't think I could count 14 of them. Yep, they're all kind of in separate uh, enclosures. So we have a handful of them in here. Now, I have to ask though, cause they're pretty small, but I don't see any parents around hanging out by any means. Where are the parents? Is there any sort of parental care with these individuals? Um, so after these uh, eggs hatch, there's no parental care with the babies. Um, but an interesting thing about uh, these type of pythons, when the female lays eggs, uh, they usually lay them in a tree cavity and the female snake will actually um, help incubate the eggs. And one way that they do this is they actually can contract their muscles, what looks like a shivering motion. Wow. Um, and that actually helps bring in heat to the eggs. So she can keep them at just the right temperature. That is fascinating because I know a lot of you who are tuning in this morning to Z Learning, you've definitely heard the term cold blooded before. Now, let me go ahead and explain that a little bit better because cold blooded doesn't necessarily mean they have cold blood. What it actually means is that reptiles don't generate their own body heat. They rely on their environment around them to either warm up or cool down. But what Karen just explained is a fascinating way for these species to actually keep their eggs warm and actually incubate them. That is so interesting because more often than not in the reptile world, parents really don't do a whole lot of work. They leave their eggs and they head on out and these kiddos are on their own. Now for these individuals, like Karen just said, they hatch out and they're on their own and they're expected to hunt and find their own food. Now, Amelia was just wondering, she just commented in, are these snakes fast or slow? Well, right now it looks like we're looking at kind of a more relaxed individual. This individual that Karen's holding though is moving around a little bit more. Tell us a little bit about their behavior, Karen. Kind of what's a normal day look like for tree boas? Um, tree pythons, yeah. excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so these guys um, would do a slow hunting. Um, they do have the capability of moving fast if they are hunting prey and reach out to strike. Their strike is very quick. Um, they are arboreal.
male species. So that's why you see um, some of the other babies that Marlo was focusing on. And this guy is kind of clinging to my hand. Um, they have what we call a prehensile tail, Ooh, which yeah. means, <laughs> yeah. You can see it curled up right there. Yeah. That's perfect. So this little guy can use this tail as basically an arm to hold on to the tree branches. Kind of another little interesting thing while we're looking at it, if you look at this tail, um, you see how it's dark on the end? Yeah. When they're hunting, they can use this tail um, to hunt, and it's called a caudal lure. Um, so they'll kind of wiggle it around, and maybe lizards, other little prey items might think that it's a bug of some sort and come over and try to eat it and then they can turn around and I never knew that. That is fascinating. Okay, say that word one more time. Coddle lure. Fascinating. Okay, yeah, so it's like fishing. It's like I was going to say, okay, so correct me if I'm wrong. Is that similar then to like a snapping turtle that would use their tongue to kind of wiggle around to hopefully catch prey? Yes, absolutely. Cool. Okay. So those of you who've seen that video before, or maybe even seen our alligator snapping turtle right here at Riverbanks, you may be seeing that wiggly tongue, similar kind of idea, but we're talking about a tail instead. I did pause though on a quick question because it was a great one. Jamie commented in, is the mom snake here at Riverbanks? Karen, tell us where these individuals actually are out on habitat for guests to see when we are open. Yeah, so the adults, um, both mom and dad, are on exhibit up in the koala knockabout um, in our Australian section. Um, it's part of where they are naturally found in the wild. Um, and interestingly, um, Dad is actually quite up there in age. Um, he's 21, 22 years old. Wow. Um, kind of their average life expectancy is somewhere between 20 and 30. So the, when we do eventually reopen here at Riverbanks, you can actually check out the parents of these individuals. They're hanging out in Koala Knockabout. They're the big snake habitat right there. But for now, these individuals are going to kind of hang out behind the scenes as they grow and mature because they wouldn't hang out, of course, with the big adults quite, quite yet. But there's another question that keeps coming in, Karen. And I know since you work with reptiles and amphibians, you get this question all the time. People want to know, are they poisonous? Are they venomous? There's too many questions for me to count that are coming in. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and cut to the chase. Karen is a brave individual, and yes, she works with a lot of unique, wild, and sometimes dangerous animals, but these individuals we are handling today are non-venomous. In fact, Karen, tell us a little bit more about the differences between poisonous and venomous. Let's go ahead and debunk some of those myths right now. Sure. Um, actually, we would kind of refer to our snakes more of venomous or non-venomous. Um, poison kind of uh, revolves around um, a non-injecting method, which uh, our venomous snakes have fangs, which will then uh, inject their prey with their venom. Um, so a non-venomous snake is what we call a constrictor. Um, these guys would go about mm -hmm. grabbing and biting their prey and then coiling around it really tightly to hold on um, until they had a chance to consume it. All right, everybody. So you heard it here at Riverbanks. They are not poisonous and they are non-venomous individuals. So don't worry, Karen is safe and so am I. And so are all 400 of you that are tuning in this morning too. I'm loving all these questions that y'all are sending in. I will say once again, we have other team members from our communications department that are answering those questions as we go along. So hopefully if we miss them, they're catching them and letting y'all know all those different answers. Let's go ahead and see if we can find some other ones. Karen, I want to get a closer look, though, at some of these other individuals. Because right now, how that individual is kind of moving around is a little different than how they typically spend most of their day. Because when you come here to Riverbanks, you notice that they're spending their time up in the treetops. And how do they kind of, I guess, wrap around? You talked about that tail quickly, but they kind of have an iconic way to hang out. Yeah, so they create kind of like a loop saddle. Um, they wrap around different segments of their body around a perch, a tree branch. Um, this is kind of their resting position. Hmm. So a lot of times you'll see the adults up in koala um, and they're typically in that pose, that position. Um, the adults are mostly nocturnal. Um, so during the day when you come, they're in a resting, sleeping uh, position, whereas uh, the babies actually um, are more diurnal hunters. Wow, interesting. So they not only change color as they mature, but they also change their activity level when they're most likely to go hunting for their prey. Now, since you brought up actually hunting, what do snakes like these like to eat both in the wild, but also here at Riverbanks? Um, so in the wild, uh, babies would probably prey on small lizards, uh, really small mammals, even perhaps um, large moths. Uh, not a ton of research has been done about juvenile um, 
diet. Yeah. Um, but in adults, they're going to feed mostly on um, some type of small mammal. Yeah, absolutely. And I would assume then here at Riverbanks, we actually recreate that diet in similar kind of ways. Right, absolutely. So then I've been noticing a couple of questions. Alexis and William were wondering if they like the camera. You know, they don't mind actually. I wouldn't say they're camera hogs this morning, but they're actually doing a great job hanging out so close to our camera. Hopefully y'all are getting a great view out there as we're up close and personal with some of our youngest snake residents. Oh, I caught another question. Oh, Kelly was wondering, are they endangered? What's the kind of their status out in the wild? Their status in the wild currently is a uh, least concern. Oh, um, good news, perfect. <laughs> yep, uh, although these animals have been known to be collected pretty heavily for the pet trade. So they are, of course, at risk, just like any animals out there as far as habitat destruction, even for the wildlife trade, like Karen just mentioned. Um, but thankfully, right now, they have a stable population out in the wild. Um, so tell us a little bit more than, since we have these 14 juveniles now here at Riverbanks, are they going to stay here, head to other zoos? Kind of what's the plan? I know they're young right now, but you always have something up your sleeves, of course. <laughs> right, um, so really important part, um is making sure that we have sustainable collections um, for ourselves and we also help and participate with other zoos and aquariums so um, some of these individuals will be going to other zoos um, to help uh, their um, exhibits and to be able to show people about green tree pythons as well absolutely it's all about teamwork so we work with those other accredited zoos and aquariums not only all around the country but also all around the world to help create these sustainable populations to create connections with some amazing animals from all over the world. Now I have to be very candid with you, Karen. We just got called out because we've been talking about these animals for a long time. We haven't mentioned where they're from. Where are these <laughs> animals actually found in the wild? Yeah, these guys are um, found in the wild in New Guinea, um, some islands of Indonesia, Aru Island, um, and also the north tip point of Australia. So they are found in kind of Southeast Asian island chains, kind of, if you've noticed, well, since they're on exhibit over with koalas, they would kind of have a little bit of an overlap with koala range, kind of that Australasia area. So Ashley, they are not native to South Carolina. Don't worry, you're not going to be finding these individuals, except for here at Riverbanks, of course. But Alexis and William, I am so glad that you asked that today, because we just got so carried away talking about all these other cool facts about them. Oh, okay, Melissa, I'm so glad that you asked because, you know, we get this question all the time. Karen, I know you're familiar with it. Do they bite? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I think the standard uh, thing that we all say is uh, anything with a mouth bites. Um, these guys don't have a reaction to us unless perhaps it's feeding time. They are babies, so they are defensive. Um, but for the most part, they're pretty calm. So another quick question that came in, I know that a second ago we were talking about what they eat and kind of how they're fed, of course. Kennedy, age 10, was wondering, how much do they eat every day? And that actually kind of circles back around to what we were talking about originally of them being cold-blooded or ectotherms, which means that they don't produce their own body temperature, which means that they kind of use a different amount of energy than us. So Karen, how often do these individuals eat? Um, so babies might eat uh, anywhere five, seven days, every five to seven days. Um, adults, maybe seven to 10 days. So they definitely don't eat every day. Whoa, okay, so wait a second. You mean that I eat at least three times a day. I know all of you who are tuning in can probably agree. These individuals go days without eating and it might even just be once a week you're saying? Correct, much slower metabolism. That is insane. So when we talked about those kind of different lifestyles, they have a different energy need as far as their biology is concerned. They just need less energy than us, which means that they're having to eat less. So their appetite's a little different. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're skipping meals, that they would eat more out in the wild. They would only eat what is absolutely necessary out in the wild and also here at Riverbanks too. So that's fascinating. What a difference between us and some of our reptile friends. I wanna thank all of you for joining and we still have a huge number of people tuning in. Hopefully we can get to all of these questions later today. We're gonna to be in direct contact, of course, with Karen, so that way we can get all the information mm -hmm. back out to you. But let's go ahead and take another peek in over at our other individuals over here. But y'all, if you are just tuning in now, I wanted to let you know where we are. We are hanging out behind the scenes in our aquarium and reptile complex. We're in our propagation room. Now I know I mentioned that big word at the beginning. We haven't really explained it yet. Propagation truly just means that it is a behind the scenes area where actually a lot of our younger animals hang out, specifically our younger reptiles. 
So propagation is all a part of our sustainable breeding programs that Karen was talking about here a second ago. And these individuals are a very, very important part of that. Well, thank you everybody so much for tuning in live. And of course, a big, huge thank you to Karen for joining us. Thanks so much. We love your mask, by the way, Karen. We love the frogs, of course. Herpetologist, you had to have all of it. Let's go ahead and get another close look at our quick little animal friend here this morning, a juvenile green tree python. All right, everybody, let's go ahead and turn around this camera. I want to big a big thank you, everybody who tuned in this morning, and I hope that you join us tomorrow live, 10 a.m. We're going to head to the coolest exhibit in the zoo. Now, I don't have any bias. When I say coolest, I mean it is the coldest exhibit here at Riverbanks. We are heading to Penguin Coast for a behind-the-scenes look at our black and white feathered friends. So join us 10 a.m. tomorrow morning for yet another Z-Learning adventure. Thanks so much, everybody, and we'll see you tomorrow morning.